Well, welcome everyone to the Sunday night edition of Optometric Education Consultants uh, webinar series. This is an interactive learning course or synchronous virtual. We're going to be doing nightmares and nonsense, navigating neuro op. And tonight we have Dr. Joe Salka as our webinar uh, speaker here. Dr. Joseph Salka is an attending optometric physician at the Center for Sight in Sarasota, Florida. This is a large medical surgical practice where he focuses on glaucoma management and neuroophthalmic disease. And we're going to hear some of his expertise tonight with this lecture. Joe is the residency education coordinator at the Center for Sight and director of optometric business development for USI. Joe was formerly professor of optometry at Nova Southeastern University College of Optometry for 28 years, where he served as the chief of the Advanced Care Service, director of glaucoma service, and the program coordinator and supervisor for ocular disease residency. Joe, you were quite busy while you were at Nova. Dr. Salka is the founding member of both the Optometric Glaucoma Society and Optometric Retina Society. He is also founder uh, and former chief of the Neuroophthalmic Disorders and Optometry Special Interest Group for the American Academy of Optometry. He is also a glaucoma diplomat at the American Academy of Optometry. In 2021 and 2022, he was ranked number four optometrist in the U.S. by, mag by Newsweek magazine, America's Best Eye Doctors List. Joe is a colleague, friend, partner, co-owner of Optometric Education Consultant. Joe, listen closely as the audience gives you a big round of applause. The virtual platform is all yours. Well, thank you, Greg. Tonight, uh, we're going to be talking some neuro op. And people who have known me uh, throughout my career know that I have been very involved in the glaucoma community, in the glaucoma sphere. And that's where I got my glaucoma diplomate. Uh, my, the last 18 years, I would say, of my academic career at Nova, I did nothing but glaucoma and uh, had a lot of experience with a lot of you know, really bad advanced and, and end stage diseases. Now I've actually diversified and gone to a large medical surgical practice, and you know the surgical practice is the is the emphasis uh, here. And they have you know we have a lot of really fine ODs, uh, really good people who who do a lot of glaucoma management. We have a, a terrific glaucoma specialist and glaucoma surgeon. What we don't have is nerve. And when I interviewed for my position, the head ophthalmologist who founded everything said, look, we're a surgical practice. We're never going to hire a neuro-ophthalmologist. We would appreciate if you would do that for us. So that's what I've been doing. And, and frankly, I've been, I feel like I, at this point in my career, I've got more that I can educate and help our colleagues uh, in, this, in this area. In fact, uh, Friday after the late afternoon, when I was finishing up one of my neuro op nightmares uh, in clinic. Greg, I got a text. I think your name was on that. Were you part of that stream? There, there are two number two numbers I didn't recognize. Some of you had an optic nerve problem. Yeah, I I connected you because I was on the road traveling, and uh, that was a former colleague or a classmate of mine and uh, his wife. So okay, well, I wasn't sure of the numbers, but you know that's what we that you know guys, that's what we do. You know, you you, you need something like this. You reach out to Greg uh, or myself uh, via text, uh, via email, and we're really really happy to help. So, like I said, interesting enough, Greg. I, I, I was I was it was past five o'clock on a Friday. I was dealing with my own neuro op nightmare that night when when your <laughs> colleagues call contact me in. So what I tell people, you know, in neuro op, 70 to 80 percent of what I do is nonsense. It's just kind of sitting down and figuring things out. And it ultimately amounts to nothing. Now, the other 20 to 30 percent are true nightmares, and we'll talk about those. But, you know, in, in neuro op, having nightmares, you know, nightmare patients every day, it would be just so uh, draining. 
So a lot of what I what I do is just kind of filter it out. And I tell patients, I tell patients, you know, most of what I do is nonsense. And, I, 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 and they're happy to hear that they fall under nonsense. And, you know, they don't like hearing that they're, they're you know, they fall under the nightmare category. So I'm going to try to help navigate a few recent cases that I that I worked through and we can, exp you know, we can share uh, together. Uh, I've been a consultant or advisory board for a couple of uh, different companies. There's nothing that is is mentioned here that uh, that I have any sort of uh, uh, relationship with that's relevant. In fact, all relevant relationships have uh, indeed been mitigated. And as Greg says, I'm a co-owner with him with of OEC. Now the question becomes, why do neuro op? Well, neuro op really is a financially rewarding specialty, said nobody ever. If we look at uh, this information for OMEG, the ophthalmic mutual insurance company, number of claims per specialty, narrow is really very, very small. But we look at what uh, what the payout is, neuro is probably the highest. And if you're talking neuro oncology, you know, take this, take this and put it on top of that. If it's in a child, put it on top of that, you can see what you know where where this can all be uh, very, very unpleasant. Now there are not enough neuro ophthalmologists. There's about 250 clinical neuro ophthalmologists across the whole country. Uh, and academically, they only have 45 fellowship spots, and this year only 25 were filled. So that's going to be 25 new neuro ophthalmologists throughout, throughout the country. And that's not counting who's going to be retiring. It can be a high risk, as I just showed you with the OMEG data. You know, these people have a, a really bad tendency to want to get sick and die on you. And I was talking about. Uh, this topic at our practice retreat uh, with our ODs and MDs, and people have had, uh, you know, they have some ex have some experience. Maybe you know, ophthalmologists they they had a rotation in neuro in neuro op uh, for a quarter, and you always wonder, is this something that's urgent? You know, is this something that is, is going to go bad quickly? Can it wait? You got to you got to pull it back out of your uh, you know, out of your experience, out of your rotation, out of your residency, and you know, where where's the stand? And some of these things can actually be fairly complicated. And as I was talking to my ophthalmological colleagues, it's not like they're doing premium IOL cataract surgery, where you get a patient who theoretically is going to love you for the rest of your life. A lot of this is what I call diagnose and adios. You know, there there may not be a lot of uh, personal satisfaction in it. And it can be schedule busting. I can't, in my practice, I'm doing I'm doing virtually all the neuro op. We had a retinal specialist who did it. Now that I'm here, he doesn't touch it. He sends it all to me. And any of my colleagues, either outside or inside the practice, if they have a patient they want me to see, I will see them. Now I'm not academic neuro op. You know, we don't have two hours to work through people, these patients, and you know, neutralize their RAPD with, with neutral density filters and do all the nine positions of gaze and do the cover, uncover. I have to see glaucoma patients, post-op, pre-op, emergencies, corneal issues, primary care, and these can be scheduled busters. And if anybody wants me to see a patient, Virtually 100% of the time, unless there's something unusual, I will see that patient and deal with the ramifications later. So there are a lot of reasons not to do it. Why do we do it? Well, it saves lives. You know, neuro-ophthalmology is going to save lives. And that's kind of why I do it. And at this stage of my career, it's kind of important. It's, it's very important to me to have, you know, something that is academically challenging to me. So the first one. Is this a nightmare or is this nonsense? She's a 23-year-old female who has a sudden onset pupil dilation with an ipsilateral headache. It is not a thunderclap headache, but she definitely has headache. Medical history normal. She's 20-20 in each eye. Her pupils, she's about has about three millimeters of anisocoria. Left is larger. Anisocoria greater in bright illumination. Previously, she was isocorp. She has no afferent defect. She can't accommodate. There's an accommodative response. Remainder of her exam is normal. Her, she has no double vision, no ptosis, no medication use. 
And she had a similar incident about two days early, which resolved within several hours. And it's not a fixed and dilated pupil. It does react. It is just looking like that. And there's about a three millimeters of asymmetry, which she reports was never there previously. So I think this brings us to our first uh, polling question, Greg. Is this a nightmare or is this nonsense? It's a nightmare because pupil dilation and headache equals aneurysm or it's nonsense. And this is a person who's going to do really quite well. So as I'm watching the, the, the chat box here, Joe, uh, Barry puts in migraine space related dot, dot, dot. I'm not sure if that means if he's asking if it's migraine, was there a migraine? No, she's not. She's not been a migraine person. She's never been diagnosed with uh, with migraine. She is a bit of a headachey young woman. And interestingly enough, she was an optometry student at that time. Had a uh, comment come in, it or it just says idiopathic episode, and then uh, another comment come in. It says pharmacological. No pharmacology, even though she's an optometry student. No pharmacology involved was involved, and the people was reactive. So I think we, we got a lot of people, a lot of people in already, like almost ninety percent. Greg, that's excellent. So a number think it's a nightmare because the dilated pupil and headache and other people think it might be uh, it might be nonsense. And that's where it falls. This is actually neuro-op nonsense. She has benign episodic pupillary medriasis. I, 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 I've encountered a number of these in my, in my career and half of them are by history. But when they get in the office, they actually may not be midriatic at that point. But it's an episodic unilateral medriasis, which can, which can last for minutes to sometimes week, weeks. Usually it's a few hours or maybe a few days. It's accompanied by blurred vision, which is usually a faulty accommodation more than anything, and a little bit of a headache, but it's not a debilitating type of headache. It is usually afflicting young, healthy females who may have a migraine history already, it happens to men, and they may not actually have a, a, a true diagnosis of migraine. But they get these peculiar sensations about the affected eye. Uh, it, it often will progress to a headache, but not your typical debilitating migraine, and there's no aura involved. And most of the blurred vision is sort of like a, a defective accommodation. Important that the lid and motility defects are not present. This is very isolated. And as such, extensive medical testing is uh, unremarkable. This is exactly the kind of person I would tell this, this falls in the category of, of nonsense. Now, we don't exactly know what it is you know, postulated throughout the, the literature. You know, is it increased sympathetic activity like a reverse Horner syndrome? Well, that's never been proven. I don't think that's uh, a good postulate. Is it a pupil paralysis following migraine? Well, in those situations, those are typically ophthalmoparetic migraines. They tend to last a lot longer. Sometimes they can actually be permanent. Is there a, sp a spasm of the iris dilator? Well, the pupil is round, so that's not really likely. Now, what about pharmacologic dilation? There is a sympatholytic drug. There's going to be no light or near reactivity at all. Those are those are fixed and dilated. You put your BIO headset on, you can do a peripheral examination. Now, if they're overusing sympathomimetic uh, medicines, uh, such as vasoconstrictor, it can mimic it, and we have to kind of rule that all out. Now, when you have anisocoria greater in bright than dim, it's usually a parasympathetic dysfunction. But this is not an aneurysm. The lack of atosis and the lack of uh, ophthalmoparesis kind of rules out aneurysmal compression. It may be an Edinger-Westfall lesion. Maybe there's transient ischemia to the Edinger-Westfall nucleus, which is where the pupil and motor fibers uh, arise. 
More likely than that, it is a migraine variant. That's probably the most likely etiology. And historically, these patients uh, in evaluations have had you know, imaging, uh, serology, they have had lumbar puncture. There's nothing that we're going to find. So the treatment is nothing except to avoid any unnecessary testing. You know, educate the patient, reassure the patient, and they're generally pretty, uh, pretty happy about that. Now, our pupil rules to remember, anisocoria greater than dim is a sympathetic dysfunction because the dilator muscles are not working. All right, that's what probably we're looking at with a Horner syndrome. And in a dark room, that uh, asymmetry or anisocoria will diminish. So look for that dilation lag. Or perhaps maybe they're even using a myotic. Plausible, possible today with the uh, with the uh, medicines that they have out now for uh, for uh, for increasing reading. Anisocoria greater in light, the sphincter muscles not working. That's a parasympathetic dysfunction. That could be a part of a third nerve palsy. Could be a tonic pupil, light near dissociated. Could be pharmacologic or traumatic, and those tend not to have any reactivity at all. So the non-reactive pupil is usually either pharmacologic or there's an issue with, with trauma, which may have been surgical. So fixed hey, Joe, and dilated. Yeah. So Joe, as you're rolling through here, mm -hmm. um, early on, there was someone having trouble uh, hearing. So I wanted to make sure everyone could hear it. And it sounds like everyone can. We have maybe a colleague that can't. Uh, but someone's asking a question. Was there a possible APD? I think PRS there, means possible. Ex excellent question. There is no afferent defect. The examination was normal, and the vision was 20-20. So it was fixed and dilated, unresponsive to light and near. There is no ophthalmoparesis notosis. It is either iris trauma or it's a, a pharmacologic pupil, as we see here, David Bowie. You know, people thought he had heterochromia. No, he actually had a dilated pupil. Uh, when he was 13 years old, he got into a fight with his best friend, George Underwood, over a girl, got hit in the eye, caused paralysis of the sphincter muscle, and he always had a dilated pupil. So fixed and dilated, no response to light or near, it's trauma or it's pharmacologic. So an isolated dilated pupil is not an aneurysm. Patients who are ambulatory, with an isolated dilated pupil, no ptosis, no ophthalmoparesis, so they're going to have uh, an iris or a gangliotic lesion or medication misadventure. It's not a, it's not an aneurysmal palsy. Now, if the patient's comatose, it might be a different story. So, no imaging is needed in these patients for isolated dilated pupils. Anything come in, Greg? No, we're good. All right. Is this a nightmare or nonsense? 78-year-old male, acute onset diplopia, blurred vision, and dilated pupils. Got a little bit of everything going on here. He went to the emergency de department. He was worked up for a stroke. He had a CT and a CTA and an MR, and, and, and I should say, I'm sorry, MRA. I need to adjust that. So CTA, MRA, CT, MRI, all normal. I reviewed the reports. Everything seemed to be in order. So it referred to me from one of my colleagues in the practice. When he gets to me, uh, he went to her after his uh, ER uh, visit and they worked him up for stroke and said he didn't have a stroke. Uh, she was uncomfortable with uh, patient nystagmus, horizontal double vision. By the time I saw the patient a day or two later, he said his vision was improving. The pupils were a little bit less dilated. He did have an endpoint nystagmus in each eye and a very nonspecific horizontal double vision. He was on an anti-muscarinic uh, for his bladder, but there have been no changes in that medicine, no increase or decrease in the dosage. So that brings me to polling question number two, Greg. Is this a nightmare or is this nonsense? It's a nightmare because there's just too much going on for it to be anything but, or is it nonsense? And people are rolling in very nicely. A lot of a uh, lot of good responsiveness on a Sunday evening. 
<laughs> uh, one thing I think it might be interesting, I'm, I'm just kind of curious on the uh, now we're in fall. If you can put in the chat room, do you prefer seven to nine on Sundays or eight to 10 on Tuesdays? So we need to know this going forward in January. That will help us. Greg, we're almost up to almost up to 90% already. So people, the predominant part of the audience thinks it's a nightmare because there's too much for it to be going on, or uh, is you know, almost half thinks it could be actually be uh, could be nonsense. All right. Well, I will tell you know as I teach my you know teach teach residents teach everybody. When I'm doing when I'm doing the neural op, the most important thing that one can do is just stop talking, shut up, and listen. If you listen to the patient, they're going to they're going to, they're going to, they're going to lead you. Now, there's no whole list of history that's going to work on every patient every time. A lot of times when they come from people inside my practice, I have an exam I can look I can look back on that helps me a little bit. You know, I, uh, most of the, most of the tests have been already been done. They need me to help figure it out. So usually I walk in and I sit down, I greet the patient and their spouse or whomever is with them, their caregiver. And I ask, tell me the story. Yeah, just tell me what happened. Tell me when this all happened, what were you doing? Why were you doing it? What, where, did it where did this all come from? And if you listen, they will tell you. And as a history, as you're telling the story, as, as things come up, that is actually pertinent, I'll redirect them, and we'll go down that. But it's mostly, I just let them talk. Now, here's what was really Im impressing to me. One, he has had good imaging, CTA, CT, MRI, MRA, everything looked in, nor looked, uh, looked in order. I don't think anything was missing. And he's improving. His vision was, he felt his vision was improving. He felt his pupils were dilated still. His wife didn't really think that they were dilated uh, as much. He did have a bit of an endpoint nystagmus and a kind of a non specific horizontal double vision. All right. So, what about that history? What happened? Well, as he tells me, he and his wife started off in Connecticut and they drove down to Sarasota straight through. The only time they stopped was to get gas to use the restroom, and he said they went. They stopped at the Seven Eleven because Seven Eleven had this special on Big Gulp. If he bought it, he can get a free refill. So his entire time there, he is stopping and, and refilling diet soda, and probably he probably looked like this by the time he got through. I would probably estimate he drank about three liters and. You know, a colleague of ours, Robert Hasty, he was an internist, has always said, whatever a patient tells you, they ingest triplet because they are all underestimating. And this sounds dilated pupils, blurred vision, toxicity. We explained it and said, look, I'm going to bring you back in a week. If you get worse, I want you to tell me. If you get better, I want you to tell me. About three days later, he calls and said, you know, I'm going to pass my appointment. Everything is normal. Got, got speed. All's well. This was nonsense. Always think toxicity. Take care with Vesicare. Vesicare is a bladder control medicine. I had a patient uh, who was being treated for glaucoma, and her pressure started uh, to ro to rise uh, to the 30s on medicine, on a, on a hypotensive uh, agent. And I added a medicine, and pressure kept going up. And I added another medicine, and pressure kept going up. You know, I'm adding medicine, and her ILP is going up. Then one day she calls and tells me she's got blurred vision in both eyes and her pupils are dilated. And I bring her in and indeed, you know, she's got bilaterally dilated sluggish pupils. She's got blurred vision. Going back to the history, what we ferreted out was she was using Vesicare 5 milligrams. Her primary care physician said, we're going to double your dose. He prescribed 10 milligrams. She was under the impression that she was still using five milligrams, so she figured 10 would be taking two. She actually quadrupled her dose and ended up with toxicity. And here's a case of the curbside consult. I was in Trinidad and Tobago at a conference. I was actually focusing on neurological issues. 
and are sitting uh, at dinner next to the wife of the society president. And, and you know, she was she was doing a curbside consult because she was actually very, very worried. You know, she had a tonsillectomy about two months earlier, and she developed some facial and jaw pain. Uh, 48 years old, a little bit young for temporal arteritis. And she was complaining that she had memory loss and she had lost her, her sense of sm uh, smell and taste. And this was pre-COVID. And she was really worried that, you know, she was being evaluated with potential neurodegenerative conditions. Now, the problem was she had been seen by a number of specialists, neuro, ENT, or primary care physician. I found that she was on an NSAID. She was on multiple medications, including at least two oral antibiotics. We had a conversation. So I don't think that you have a neurodegenerative condition. Everybody's ruling a lot of stuff out. I think you've got medical toxicity. And I can tell you my own personal experience with a medicine called Mucinex. I have no uh, financial interest in that product. And I use this when I get an upper respiratory infection. I always worry about... Uh, the post-nasal drip giving me laryngitis. And I can tell you right now, after I use two or perhaps three doses of mucinex, I lose my sense of smell and taste. So what was the outcome? I said, look, you know, there's no reason for you to be on all these medicines. They want you to try to consider just stopping your medicines and see what happens. She stops all of her oral medicines, all the antibiotics that she was on. Within uh, several weeks, then she's back to normal. She had a sense of smell, taste. She didn't have that brain fog. And we were dealing with toxicity. So it's not always a brain tumor. You know, sometimes you got to think about medication toxicity. You know, what, what are the hallmarks? Blurred vision and dilated pupils. Not so much refractive error, but they would tell you their vision is blurry. There are a number of, of medicines out there that can do this. Ethambutol can cause a toxic optic neuropathy. These are patients that you really need to follow very carefully. I've got uh, one patient newly on ethambutol for MAC, and I followed this, these people every one to two months. You want to look at their fundus. You want to make sure the optic nerve is not pale, OCT, visual acuity, color vision, uh, and visual fields. Any sort of change or any sort of, uh, of loss of vision, any changes on these tests, we need to contact the physician who prescribed the medicine. Amiodarone or Pacerone can cause a toxic optic neuropathy. Vigabatrin is an anticonvulsant for epilepsy in children two years or older, can cause a permanent concentric peripheral field loss. This is probably drug-induced injury to the photoreceptor and the ganglion cells and their axons. So the big ones, and of course, is hydroxychloroquine. But uh, ethambutol, amiodarone, vigabatrin, these are, these are some that we have to point out and recognize in the history. Greg, do you have any comments? Because I know you've dealt with some of these before. Yeah, I have a comment, um, but uh, we have a question. And, and I think it goes back to the, uh, to the gentleman drinking the, the, uh, the soda. And it said, uh, Stephen at 733 put in, uh, caffeine related question mark. I don't know if it's caffeine related or if it was uh, artificial sweetener. All I know is that that history was very compelling. Patient was getting better. Imaging was all normal. My approach is, you know, let's see what happens. And he got better. So caffeine, I think probably artificial sweetener because artificial sweetener does can induce uh, in some prone people uh, headache and migraine. So it's not, it's not impossible to consider in a patient like that. And when you were That's chatting right. about, when you were chatting about ethambutol, you mentioned uh, MAC and we need a clarification on what is MAC. Mycobacterium avian complex. It's, so not, you know, it's not, not always yeah. tuberculosis. Yeah. So basically it's the tuberculosis uh, molecule that's out there, but it doesn't always have to be TB. There's one that, uh, that I see quite frequently in my area. It's uh, mycobacterium uh, aviolum, <clears throat> which is kind of what I think of. It's kind of like blepharitis, but of the aviola of the, of the lungs. And it's not TB, 
but it's the same uh, maco ba uh, mycobacterium. So there's a bunch in that, and so they just get classified as the the mac Josephine. Um, you know, Joe mentioned uh, ethambutol. I've had uh, actually three over the over about the last two and a half years. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I guess my air would have been just not following them as closely as I should. I was seeing them about every six months and, and they did come in. And when they did come in, they came in with significant loss. And actually one was coming in every three to four months because she was a glaucoma patient. And I just actually took a video, Joe, of her the other day because uh, she was in and um, I just kind of wanted to hear her symptoms because I warned her of it and warned her of it. And she just kind of came in and she was like 2200, but I have a nice little follow up with her, how she recovered um, most of her visual field back. Uh, so ethambutol and then uh, amiodarone, I see more, uh, you know, obviously corneal issues with that, but I have two cases of toxic optic neuropathy and those were sad cases because basically they're like 2200, 2400 without any recovery. So, and I haven't seen anything with uh, Vega Batrin that's out there. I lecture with Tracy, as you know, from time to time, that has a black box warning on it, as she'll point out during uh, during the lectures. And when I went back, when I when I started this lecture, I showed the omic data for uh, insurance. Uh, this is this is an easy one to fall into, just not recognizing the potential. We have someone making a comment here that says mm -hmm. Afrin nasal spray toxicity can cause speech slash cognitive disorders. Is that a question mark or a statement? Well, it looks like a statement. I, will, I won't challenge that. I'm sure that's probably correct. And then uh, would you have sent Big Gulp patient for imaging if it was not already done? Uh, you know, the woulda, shoulda, coulda, I don't know. The person comes in with that history and is improving and says he's improving, I would say I would probably, I, I might just watch that one. And then Kim asks, um, and, and I'll, I'll give a comment and I'd like to see your comment. It's, she's asking, you know, should we be screening all of our amiodarone and, and how often? And, you know, obviously you're gonna get the corneal whirls. The corneal whirls um, can lead to uh, vision loss. Um, there's kind of three, four stages to that keratopathy. And when it gets to three and four through irregular astigmatism, people can, can, uh, uh, get, uh, vision loss and you can ask the cardiologist or whoever prescribed it to maybe consider. And I've had reversal from people, 2050, 2060, go back to like, say 2025. And that's the irregular astigmatism from the cornea. I've had, like I said, two people with the amiodarone, you know, I just kind of warned them on that they're taking it. And, you know, if they start getting vision loss, um, but I don't really see them any sooner than a year uh, or whatever I'm following for their cornea condition. Um, Joe, thoughts on, you know, the amio, I guess the amiodarone kind of optic neuropathy. I would say amiodarone, you probably should be following uh, them probably every two to three months, maybe three to four. Uh, if you're looking at ethambutar, probably one to two months. That's a little bit more toxic. Well, here's one. Is it a nightmare or is it nonsense? He's a 94-year-old man referred uh, in, in, within my practice where partial third nerve palsy. You can see and for, this is a subconscious. Don't worry about that. Uh, that has no pertinence. But you can see he's got a little bit of ptosis. He was already dilated by a tech in another office. You know, my colleague said, I vouch for my tech. She used to be a physician in another country before she became a tech. She knows what she's doing. All right. So the pupils were quote unquote normal, but I see them. You can see this pupil is dilated, but that pupil is dilated as well because he had pharmacology, uh, pharmacologic dilation. He has no pain. He's never had, he doesn't know what a headache is. He's never had head pain in his life. So there's nothing to compare it to. Medically, he's 94 years old. He's got a pacemaker. He's hypertensive. He's got kidney disease, and that uh, could make some, for some challenging imaging. That brings me to polling question number three, this partial third nerve palsy. Is this a nightmare or is this nonsense? It's a nightmare because it's an aneurysm. It's nonsense because the risk of aneurysm is low. 
or it's nightmare-ish because of the dilation, I can't really look at the pupils. Yes. And maybe, maybe we should have uh, some considerations for the ones that Greg that are nightmare-ish. There you go. <laughs> it's likely an aneurysm. The aneurysm is actually pretty low. Or we have some problems because I can't really judge the pupil because you got dilated. I got to take somebody's word for it. Word for it. Mm. And it looks like we're getting good responses in here. I think we can end the poll here. Joe, as you're doing that, I'm going to make mm -hmm. an announcement that I'm going to put the handout in the uh, in the uh, in the chat box. Excellent. So most people think it's nightmare-ish because of the dilation. Some things is the risk is low, and other things the risk is kind of high. I do think it's kind of nightmare-ish. There are a lot of considerations here I had to I had to deal with, but the biggest consideration was it's a partial third nerve palsy. And partial third nerve palsy, we have to consider them to potentially be aneurysmal, and the aneurysm is just beginning to develop. Please, as a rule, never dilate a patient with a third nerve palsy. I mean, you can take a look on dilated. You can do your wide field imaging, take a photograph, but please don't dilate because somewhere, somewhere else, someone downstream is going to need to take a look at that, and they're going to be kind of hindered. Well, diagnosis partial third with pupil sparing got a question mark. I'm going to say probably. I, I do trust. I do trust what was said. The lack of pupil involvement, no head pain is helpful in the threat assessment. Aneurysms are, are, are always painful. He is 94 years old. And, you know, you got to consider male life expectancy is 81 in 2022. So, you know, this man has already won. And if he had an aneurysm, the question is, is he, is he a candidate for, uh, for treatment? But, it needed imaging for a patient like this. You need a CT and a CTA as well as an MRI and an MRA. And because it was partial, and my thought of aneurysm was actually very low. I did work with the ER. Uh, he did go to the emergency room. His kidneys couldn't take the contrast, so we couldn't we couldn't get the uh, the CT. And the pacemaker precluded doing an MRI. So the only thing we got was a non-contrast enhanced CT of the head that said no bleed, and they, they presumed he had a quote-unquote stroke. Well, he comes back a week later, because I put him on a one week, don't fall through the cracks follow-up. Now he has progressed onto a complete third nerve palsy. We lift him up, and the pupil is not dilated, it is reactive, but he has now progressed on to a complete third nerve palsy. And let's just take a look at him. This is Bob. Complete tilsis, lift up. You can see the pupil is there, symmetrical. He can abduct, he cannot adduct, he cannot look up, he cannot look down. And you drop the lid, and double vision goes away. So that brings me to polling question number four, Greg. Is this a nightmare or nonsense? It's nightmare because it went bad on your watch or nonsense because this was expected. And Greg, what was it? What was the anybody put in the chat that they prefer Tuesday at eight or Sunday at seven for the fall, the winter? Well, you have a bunch of people taking this on Sunday, so we got a bunch of people replying seven to nine on Sunday. Good point. I guess we we do on the Tuesday webinar. We <laughs> the same thing for Tuesday. But there was a few people that said Tuesday. So okay, like Tuesday evening. Uh, someone put six to eight on Tuesday. Um, seven to nine, seven to nine, Sunday, seven to nine, Sunday. Okay, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. It's almost 50 50. Nightmare because it went bad on your watch for nonsense because this was uh expected, and that's the answer. Because when he when I knew he was there, I actually went out into the waiting room myself to greet him because I wanted to see right away and. 
I expected that he would actually progress on to a complete policy if this was ischemic vascular. Ischemic vascular policies can progress through one week. They can be no better in two weeks, but they don't get worse for two weeks. I expected this to happen. Now, the imaging he got was insufficient, but at least it, didn't, it showed that he didn't have any hemorrhaging uh, going on. And you usually see hemorrhage on a CT from aneurysm because it does leak. Most likely ischemic vascular, you tell me, you know, it, you'll be about 50% improved in six weeks, and you'll be pretty much well recovered in about 12 weeks. But we have to watch for any signs of aberrant regeneration because that tells us it's not ischemic vascular. And this is what he uh, looked like when he came back at about 11 and a half weeks. His ptosis resolved. He can look up. He can look down. He can AB duct his eye. He can AD duct his eye. He just has a little bit of residual double vision laying down, looking at the clock on his nightstand. But otherwise, he is complete, almost completely resolved at 11 weeks as we expected. Now, he is 70-year-old male with sunset retroorbital pain, followed by double vision for about a week. It's getting progressively work worse. I actually saw him uh, in the waiting room. I saw him from a distance. And I see an eyelid that's completely down, and I knew exactly what he was before he even came back. He's hypertensive, diabetic, hypercholesterolemic. He's 2030, 2020. And it was the day before Hurricane Ian was about to hit, which, you know, I'll tell you, I, I chewed him out. I said, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? The day before, don't do this. This is the worst time for you to do this. You don't do this before a hurricane. You know, it's, it's, poor, it's poor taste to have a third nerve policy before a hurricane when everything's going to shut down. Hmm. And this is what he looks like. Complete policy. You can see his pupils are symmetric. Let him go. He drip, droops down. Lift up, he is symmetric in pupil, they're both reactive. He can abduct, cannot AD duct, cannot elevate, cannot depress. And he's got a complete palsy with pupil sparing and vasculopathic risk factors. Bring us to polling question number five, Greg. So that, Joe, that leads me to a question. Uh, are yeah. hospitals built uh, in Florida in an evacuation zone? And if so, do... They have to evacuate the patients. Uh, they do. Wow. Yeah, they do. They would have to evacuate patients. So is this a nightmare? Is it nonsense? Nightmare because this one's an aneurysm. Or nonsense is probably ischemic. Or <laughs> They're all nightmares to me. So... Double vision, complete palsy, retroorbital pain, one week. Pupil, pupils symmetrical. Is an aneurysm? Is it ischemic? Or is this generally nightmarish? I hate seeing these. Good response. I'm going to end the poll. Share the results. About equal equal number of things it's an aneurysm and it's a nightmare to them or it's nonsense because it's probably ischemic and i agree this is the kind of person that i would probably get the imaging myself either same day or next day i would get it on an urgent basis through one of our local imaging centers he would need a CT, a CTA, an MRI, and an MRA. And why do we need this? Frankly, if you're looking for an aneurysm, whatever you order it has to have an A in it, a CTA or an MRA if you're looking for an aneurysm. I mean, if, if you're looking for trying to find an A, you need an A. Presumptive diagnosis, microvascular ischemia. I did have to send him to a hospital ER because... I was not confident we'd get uh, imaging done at a local imaging center. I knew we could get it done in the hospital. His imaging was normal. Uh, he came back at about six weeks. He was markedly improved. The ptosis had resolved, but his ophthalmoparesis didn't. And he was self-patching so that he could uh, function. 
So third nerve palsy, and I was down and out with ptosis from adduction, elevation, depression, deficits. It can be isochoric or anisochoric. Now the third nerve it, it arises in the in the dorsal mesencephalon at the level of the superior colliculus. You get the ocular motor nucleus. Uh, nucleus. It's going to send fascicles through the and these the, these aren't like spaghetti strings here. The fascicles will go, will go through the red nucleus and the in the cortical spinal tract and emerge into the subarachnoid space right here. Now anything occurring in this area will be complicated. If there's an insult to the nucleus, they're gonna have a third nerve palsy on one side and a superior rectus and bilateral ptosis on the other side. Now, anything going through here, the red, the red nucleus, they're gonna have uh, an apexic gait. They'll be unsteady on their feet. In the cortical spinal tract, they're gonna have uh, contralateral intention tremor. Now, in this area here, subarachnoid, uh, it runs parallel to the posterior communicating artery. It goes into the cavernous sinus, runs very close to the internal carotid artery. It will break into a superior and inferior division going through superior orbital fissure. Now, aneurysms in this area here, subarachnoid space, will gush blood into that area, and it can be fatal. Aneurysm of the internal carotid artery within the cavernous sinus is contained. They can end up with a fistula, but it is not a fatal condition. Pupil involved third palsy is a posterior communicating artery aneurysm until proven otherwise, but an incomplete palsy, partial palsy, is also an aneurysm, regardless of the pupil, because the balloon may be expanding and it's developing before your eyes. 30% of third nerve palsies are caused by aneurysm. We talk, I, I want to clarify this. I don't want you to think that every time you see a third nerve palsy, there's a one in three chance it's an aneurysm. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is they come from somewhere. And there may be a patient who, based upon the clinical features, has about a 5% risk of having an aneurysm, whereas another patient has a 95% chance of having aneurysm. So I, can't, I don't want you to think it, you, you, the odds are automatically in your favor. It is all very patient dependent. And pain is pain. It's only helpful when it's not present. Aneurysms are always painful. As they expand, they touch pain-sensitive dural structures. They leak and bleed and is irritating to the meninges. Ischemic vascular palsies are painful 90% of the time. So pain is only helpful if it's not there. If it's not there, it's highly unlikely to be an aneurysm. Vascular pathic thirds will resolve in time, but aneurysms will rupture in time, and it can be very fatal. Imaging, I mean, obviously, the gold standard is digital subtraction and uh, arteriography. But CT and CTA is actually the preferred non-invasive imaging for third nerve palsy. CT will show you subarachnoid hemorrhage. CTA will show you the aneurysm. Now, CTA requires contrast. They can't have renal impairment. They do. MRI and MRA are necessary. CTA is superior to an MRI. The patient can't have the MRI if, they're, if they're, they got a pacemaker or claustrophobic. And not, not all pacemakers preclude somebody from an MRI. We have to verify. MRI is superior if you're wrong, and it's not an aneurysm. I mean, there's a mass lesion or inflammatory debris. And the MRA adds very little time to a scan. A, a recent study in neuro-ophthalmology shows the majority of patients with third nerve palsy do not get the appropriate ur urging imaging. And what is it today? CT, CTA, MRI, MRI. That's what they need. If we can't get all of that, you know, stepping down, we get as much as we can. Now, is this nightmare or nonsense? He's a 63-year-old male who has a sudden onset of orbital pain for three days duration. Mm. It begins on a Friday, gets worse on a Saturday, worse on Sunday, comes in on a Monday. 
He's got diabetes and hypertension, both presumptively well-controlled. He's on Coumadin, and he does have a pacemaker. We can see he's got a partial ptosis, and the eye is down and out. I lift his lid. He cannot look up, cannot look down. He cannot adduct his eye, but he can abduct his eye. That with partial ptosis tells me we've got a partial third nerve palsy. Dialing is not a great picture. He's about two and a half to three millimeter pupil here, which is responsive. He's about five millimeters and unresponsive uh, on this side. And they don't have to be unresponsive. They can be sluggishly responsive. But the, the, there is an asymmetry in the pupil reflex between the normal and the abnormal eye. So, Greg, that brings me to polling question number six. Is this a nightmare or is it nonsense? I'm going to leave this one. Not, not, not going to give any, any more commentary. Greg, is anything coming into the chat room I should be aware of? Nothing there. Uh, hopefully not tuning out. They are responding very quickly. So hopefully everybody's picking, that, picking up what I put down. But if you have questions, let us know because we want to clarify. We want you to get out of this what you want to get out of it. Comment came in. It says most insurance in our area will only approve an MRI after CT has been performed, which delays proper diagnosis. Yes, that is an that is an issue. That's why in these situations, it is probably it is if you have a high suspicion, it's best to go through the emergency room. If you have a low suspicion, then you can you can you can work with that. Great responses already. I'm going to end and share the results. Most people are correctly agreeing that this is a nightmare, and I agree. Diagnosis, right pupil involved, partial third nerve palsy, likely due to an aneurysm. And let's talk about this. You know, right here, we're, we've got to be looking in the circle of Willis. And this is the posterior communicating artery right there. For the most part, that's where the aneurysm will form. You might want to ha have one at the tip of the basilar artery. You might want to ha have at the junction of the internal carotid and the posterior communicating artery right there, maybe right about there. You know, if you're if you're off of the exact vessel, it doesn't matter. You're you're in the right neighborhood. Now, the third nerve parallels the posterior communicating artery. As that aneurysm expands, it will touch it. Now, here, here are some caveats. In a, for the most part, most people, they're very close, very, very, very close. If anatomically there's space between the artery and, and the nerve, it may take a very large aneurysm to cause compression. Caveat, if they're very, very close, a small aneurysm can cause compression and it could be missed. And the pupil and motor fibers are coating the third nerve. So, and something touches from the outside, it is going to affect the nerve and the pupil and motor fibers, which gives us this dilated pupil. Now, the pupil and motor fibers are pretty well nourished by, uh, by the, the rich anastomotic watershed uh, in this area. So in people who are diabetic, hypertensive, ischemic, a a core infarct of the nerve can actually knock out the third nerve, the pupil can still be spared. 50% of these patients will die from the aneurysm rupture, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and, and the brain stem will herniate down through frame and magnum, and they're gonna have respiratory collapse. And it's gonna happen within 29 days. 20% of patients will die within 40 hours from rupture of the aneurysm. This is one of the only true emergencies that we see in optometry or ophthalmology. This is a life-threatening emergency. Half the people are going to die, right? That, that's, it's not good odds. Now, they need emergency care, and time counts. So they say, why not just send it to the ER? Send them right on over. Well, yeah, you do. But this is your typical ER physician when they encounter a patient with an eye problem. They don't have the experience or the confidence that we have. And this woman just has conjunctivitis and he doesn't want to see her. This is hmm. not what they do. We need to help. Just because a person sticks their head in a tube doesn't mean the cause is going to be found. So Joe, with, so, Joe, with that being said, there's a yeah. question that comes in that's related to this. Mm -hmm. When you send to the ER, 
Do you call the ER head to give info? Do you give the patient a order note? How do you make sure the patient actually complies and goes to the ER? Well, the last part, the way you can ensure they comply is to call an ambulance. So that's probably a very reasonable sort of thing to do. Now, if they choose not to comply, I mean, we, we, can't, we can't save them all if they won't do it. Yes, the answer to everything is yes. I call, I give the patient my cell phone number, I give the ER my cell phone number, and I write out the notes. And I want to hear from somebody what's going on. Without any information, you stick there. The, the ER physicians will do a non contrast CT of the head. That's what they do. That's their hammer. Everything to them is a nail. That is their hammer. They all get that. And that is not the proper imaging. The world's best neuroradiologist can't help you if you don't order the scan, order the right scan, and tell them what to look for. A non-contrast and an CT is not going to find an aneurysm. And I tell the patients, you, you are not going to sit, you're not going to sit there. I'm giving you a Disney fast pass. You're not going to go to the standby line. You're going to the front of the line. I gave, I sent the ER detailed notes, recommendation, and my cell phone number, and I called the triage nurse in advance. I said the people, the patient has a pupil involved right third nerve palsy, most likely cause intracranial aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery, need CT, CTA, and a neurosurgical consult stat. And obviously, can't do a pacemaker, has, you know, I can't do MRI, has a pacemaker, and I tell them this. I can guarantee you, if you tell them this, you say this, you're telling them what vessel to look at. They're going to look at that and say, you know, this guy might actually know what he's talking about. From the time the patient and his wife left my door, 45 minutes later, I got a call from the ER and, and then also from the patient's uh, wife. He was in a CT scanner within 45 minutes. He had a leaking, in another patient, there's an aneurysm right there on CTA. He had a leaking but unruptured aneurysm confirmed with CTA. He was hospitalized 23 days. He underwent endovascular packing with coils twice. His uh, ptosis improves, his motility in pupil didn't improve, but he did live. And this is what it kind of looks like now. He's got a pseudo von Graefe side. There, there is a aberrant regeneration, which is expected to happen after trauma, tumor, and aneurysm. It never happens after diabetes. If you see this lid synkinesis or dyskinesis where the eyelid doesn't go down as it should, you've got to consider there's something else going on. So third Joe, we're going to have to update. We're going to have to update your slide because the fast pass line no longer exists at Disney. It is now the Disney Genie Plus. The Disney Genie Plus. I think most people would not know what that means yet. So we'll have to and for the people the. So I we'll have to get you a, a picture so you can put both up so you can reference the people that have been there before and the people that go now. Spoken by a true Disney file. <laughs> I, I guess the difference the difference between Genie Plus and Fast Pass would probably be about thirty dollars. I'd say, am I right? Yeah, probably, probably close to twenty. But uh... so eighty percent of these aneurysms rupture within twenty nine days. A lot of patients don't make it to the hospital. Now, if the aneurysm ruptured, there's about a five percent chance you're going to die in surgery. Or, and if they don't, there's about a 60%, they're going to be in a wheelchair or have other profound neurological impairments. Now, if the aneurysm is not ruptured, there's really no mortality. Uh, about three quarters will have a normal outcome, and some patients can actually recover their, their function. And there are two ways to treat this. One is uh, with a craniotomy and putting an aneurysm clip, like a clip on a bag of potato chips. Or through endovascular coil packing, will actually go in there and they'll squeeze it and fill it in there. And, and blood can't get in, it coagulates and protects it. Now, I used to say that both procedures are very simple and straightforward to a skilled neurosurgeon. And then sometime, I guess last year, I had a retired neurosurgeon as a patient and I asked her about it and she said, yeah, uh, 
aneurysm clips are then they really suck I, I i hate doing that she said it's always bloody you open the door it's always mucky and bloody and almost all the time as soon as i start doing something the thing pops on me i got blood all over the place so the reality is it's mostly endovascular coiling right now and i i had some trouble with my uh sound so i'm just i'm gonna i'm gonna do do this for you I don't think any sounds coming through, but this is what happens with endovascular embolization. Is they're going to snake a catheter up there, and they're going to squeeze these coils out, kind of like uh, toothpaste. Take the catheter out, and it's all going to stay in there, and blood really cannot get through there. So they start off here at about the femoral artery, and they're going to take this catheter all the way up until they get to the uh, area of concern, and they're going to put it. it in there, they're going to start squeezing, squeezing these coils in. And it's kind of like, uh, I guess it's kind of like toothpaste. And they're going to keep filling it and filling it. Sometimes they have to go back a second time. Then there's a little electrical charge that kind of snips it off. They'll put some more in there. They'll snip it off. And they, and they, they retreat. Now, sometimes if the, uh, if the opening is very, very large, they'll actually put a stent in there. And that stent will stay in there and they'll put the stent in, they'll keep the vessel open and then they'll fill it up. And that packs it in there, they pack the coils in. So a question came in. It says, uh, do you know what the material, the coil is made from? I don't recall what the coil is made from. But it, it, they are all inert and MRI safe. Now, here's what you don't say to the ER doc. You don't say this patient has double vision. When you call up, you say, this patient has a posterior, has an aneurysm, a posterior communicating artery, and is going to die if he doesn't get to neurosurgery immediately. And that is their Genie Plus or Fast Pass that gets them, in, that gets them to uh, the front of the line. Now, I'm going to talk very briefly about neuroimaging for the primary care clinician. I don't read MRIs. There are probably ODs and MDs that do. I'm not one of them. I have learned in, neuro, in neuroradiology, what you don't know can hurt you a whole lot. That's why there are reasons, re, that's the reason for residencies of radiology and some specialty in neuroradiology. Thinking I'm as good as they are is irresponsible. I was doing a conference and I had a neuroradiologist and he actually identified the, uh, the ciliary body on an MRI. And that, that, that's how, you know, how good they were. I mean, it was hard enough teaching students to do that with gonioscopy. And going back to that, you know, that endovascular coiling, you, 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 thought, you thought gonioscopy was hard to learn how to do. Imagine learning how to do that. Hey, so, Joe, there, a yeah. question came in. Um, I think I know the answer, but I'll let you. Is, is mm -hmm. there a risk of rupture when the coil is inserted? The answer is yes. And there's still a risk of rupture, even if they've been fully treated, but they can only go so far. You know, there, it, 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 it can still be a fatal disease even with proper treatment. So, yes, there is there is risk of rupture. But again, the, you know, the neurosurgeon I was talking to said, yeah, anytime she had to do it, said, almost always it, it would like burst and she'd have to sew things up real quick. So, you know, doing craniotomy, they, they usually rupture too. So, Joe, so I, did a, I did a really quick Google search here. Uh, what are the coils made out of? So uh, I can use Google here and assist. Um, it says primarily inert material and then primarily inert material that is typically platinum, <laughs> soft platinum metal. Uh, and so that would be what I would answer uh, by using Google here. So there's other Actually, materials. It, it, I just found something here. Yeah. It says platinum inert, inert material. I like yeah. that. That's, that's very non-specific. That could be dirt, inert material. Yeah. Coils are made of, uh, you know, platinum, platinum and other mm -hmm. materials, you know, obviously in there, uh, so mm -hmm. that there's no reaction, but, uh, mm -hmm. uh microsurgical de 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 detectable platinum wire. So it sounds like platinum would be the answer I'd go with. So rules, order the correct scan and read the report to ensure that they did what you want them to do. If you have questions, 
concerns not reach out and ask for a reread by the radiologist. I always have a good relationship with the imaging center and find out about their practice. Some, you know, sometimes they have better results with MRI and others have better results with CTA. So here's what the order and why. Disc edema, suspect papilledema. We need a brain MRI with and without contrast looking for mass lesion, hydrocephalus, hemorrhage, flattened lobe, empty cella. We need MRV looking for cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. And that's what we put on the on the on the on the or, the orders. Optic nerve or chiasmal disease, MRI, the orbits and chiasm with and without contrast with fat suppression. You know, fat glows white in, in the orbit, and things that happen in the optic nerve tend to be white. If you don't suppress the fat, it's like looking for a snowball in a snowstorm. Optic neuritis suspecting MS, MRI, the orbits and chiasm with and without contrast with fat suppression. MRI brain with and without contrast. Also, we need MOG and, and aquaporin antibodies. That's another lecture. I'm not going to touch it here. Horner syndrome, brain imaging with and without contrast, CTA or MRI of the head and neck looking for a cerebral artery dissection, MRI of the chest and lung, apex and brachial plexus. If you don't remember all that, just tell them Horner's protocol or image the entire sympathetic plexus. Suspected aneurysm, we just talked about, CT, CTA, MRA, MRI. With concentration, circle of willness, if you think it's a high-risk aneurysm, do it through the ER and tell them what to do. Don't just send them to the ER without helping them. They won't get it right. Here is your, you know, here is your one page right here, everything you need to know, uh, neuroimaging for the primary care uh, OD. So, now, Joe, before a, you move yeah. on, there's more mm -hmm. stuff rolling in here. All right, good. Um, I think they're chatting. I think they're discussing. This one came in direct message. So I think we're uh, to me. And uh, it says, um, are they put on a blood thinner post-op? I'm assuming that's after the coiling. Well, the, the blood thinner can actually lead to uh, more, le more leakage and bleeding. So typically not. And then, you know, what is your protocol for sending? Oh, hold on. Another one came in. So let me move up. How, do, how does one get them to the, quotes, right hospital? Regional emergency rooms are not equipped to diagnose and treat. No, they, uh, most, most ERs will be able to handle the basics. They may not have a neurosurgeon uh, on call. We need to identify where is the stroke unit and where is the hospital that ha that has neurosurgery on call? In my area, we have two main hospitals. We have Venice Regional and Sarasota, Sar Sarasota Memorial. I feel comfortable using either of those. Uh, Englewood Community Hospital, I don't feel so great about. So last question here, or at least until <laughs> something rolls in, but... Uh, what is your protocol for sending Horner syndrome for neuro slash imaging workup? If it's acute, if it's acute and painful, I'll do it through the ER. We'll talk maybe, but uh, hopefully we'll get that far. Uh, if it is not acute, I will order it myself because it generally isn't urgent at that, at that time. But if it's acute and painful, uh, time is of, of the essence. Is acute less than a week? Uh, yes. Now this is an 83 year old male who's got uh, who started off with a partial third nerve palsy that evolved into a complete third nerve palsy. Bad diabetic, blood sugar in the 300s, A1C around 11. Uh, ultimately, the person who first saw uh, ordered this through an MRI through the PCP. And when I saw a patient in follow-up, I took a look at the uh, the imaging result, Im in, in, and it was written on the indication for imaging was brain ischemia. Now, there are two errors that were made here. One, the PCP, you know, you know, rather, you know rather than going directly or, or speaking to somebody directly or ordering it themselves, went through the PCP, probably inundated the PCP with uh, too much information, used the word ischemia, and that was a word he recognized and said, uh, yeah, reason for imaging was brain ischemia. Well, the reason for imaging is looking for an aneurysm. 
And the other thing that was wrong here, they ordered an MRI. Well, what we need is a MRA or a CTA looking for the aneurysm. Now, is this nightmare or nonsense? I, a 64-year-old female, I get a call from Venice Regional Hospital ER physician, gives a call, says it's Friday, it's Friday at three o'clock, and you know, my front desk lead comes back and says that uh, the ER physician wants to talk to me about a patient. And immediately I go through my, my mental Rolodex thinking, you know, did I screw somebody up and they end up in the emergency room? But no, this is not one of our patients. He said, look, I got a patient who woke up blind in her left eye. It's gotten better. He said, she has an APD. He actually used that, that term. He said, she has an APD, uh, had, a, had a head CT, which is normal. And he started, to, you know, it's very nice. That I know it's getting kind of late. It's probably going to get kind of hard to have this patient seen today. And I said, do you want me to see the patient? Said, yes, please. All right, send her on over. So she comes over. She's got 2025 right eye, 2030 left eye, a market afferent defect. So you can see her visual field. And she's got a pale, swollen optic nerve. Now, when we talk to her, her history specifically, she has about a 15-pound weight loss, a kind of dull frontal occipital headache and general malaise, and blames everything on her COVID uh, infection that she had several months earlier. So Greg, it brings me to polling question number seven. Is this a nightmare or is it nonsense? And I'm not going to give any more commentary to that. I think the case is kind of speaking for itself. Joe, here's a comment. If a patient did not have pain, would you still suspect aneurysm? The answer is it depends. Hmm. If it was painless, they were older, it was complete. And I, I assume we're talking third. It was complete and pupil spared and they have ischemic vascular disease. I would not suspect an aneurysm. If it were partial, I would suspect an aneurysm even if it was painless. I would still doubt it. But this is not one we want to make a mistake on. 20% will die within 48 hours. It's not like we change the axis on some cylinder. We don't get a remake if they die. So is this a nightmare or a nonsense? Most people say that this, this is a nightmare. And I agree. You know, she has arteritic ischemic neuropathy from GCA. I, I called the ER physician and told him what's going on. I said, she's coming back. Here's my cell phone number. We need a send rate, C-reactive protein, and platelets, and give me a call. Let me know. You know let me know, know what's happening. This was the fat, the I'm sorry, Disney Genie, is it? This you is their it. fast pass. This was their yep. fast pass. A couple hours later, I get a call from the ER. He said, the said rate's 96. What do we do now? And that's what he said. What do we do? Because what what how do I treat this patient? I said, admit the patient, begin 250 milligrams IV solumedrol every six hours for three days. We need 12 doses, followed by 80 milligrams oral until you see get them seen by rheumatology. They need either a biopsy or an ultrasound with a temporal artery. Do you want me to help arrange that? I'm always willing to help. About two hours later, I get another call from the hospital admit the admitting hospitalist who asked me the same questions. What is my dosing? When do I release them? How do I handle this? And in every case of temporal arteritis that I have had in this practice, I get about one a month at this point because our, our practice is older. I'm, I'm the one that gets filtered to. I get the same thing. The ER physician and the hospitalist, they're all very knowledgeable, but they are not confident or experienced in this. And they all ask the same thing. What do I do? And they want the help. So ischemic neuropathy is a hyperperfusion of the ciliary supply of the anterior optic nerve head. It could be arteritic or non-arteritic. In the non-arteritic form, you can have issues, such mechanical issues such as ischemic vascular disease, hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, hypertension that leads to arteriosclerotic disease. 
in the arteritic form, you get this autoimmune vasculitis. And it is typically unilateral, but a high incidence of subsequent contralateral involvement, especially in arteritic ischemic neuropathy. If you ever see what you think is a bilateral ischemic neuropathy, it is giant cell until proven otherwise. And looking at the differences, arteritic tends to be a pale, swollen optic nerve, whereas not arteritic tends to be a hyperemic swollen optic nerve. In not arteritic, we have the risk factors. They usually have an inferior arteriosclerotoma, and they often have this disc at risk, a small, crowded 0.2 CD or less uh, in, in both eyes. They can have a progressive moderate vision loss with some potential of recovery, but not usually complete. And it's usually a earlier disease. The earliest I've ever seen a patient is 37 years old, but anywhere from the 40s and beyond, you can have this disease. And it is painless. There's no pain involved. Arteritic ischemic neuropathy is a pale, swollen nerve and pain of some sort. Head pain, jaw pain, eye pain, face pain, uh, shoulder pain, hip pain. Uh, similar, very similar visual field defects and, and giant cell arteritis or polymyalgia rheumatica are risk factors. I've got a number of PMR patients and I tell them, look, if you ever have any sort of transient vision loss, transient double vision, anything like that, I need to see you immediately. It's usually a disease of older people. The average age is 72. Most of the ones I see in the early 60s, but anybody over the age of 50, you know, this is always on the menu. And there's a high risk of bilateral involvement. 65% will progress to bilateral vision loss at an average of 10 days. So you really have to have a good history about the non-visual symptoms. I, I just ask them and tell me how you feel. Headache is very common, scalp tenderness, jaw claudication. And it's not pain while chewing. It's they start to get fatigued, like they're eating a very tough steak. Ear pain, arthralgias, temporal pain, malaise, intermittent fevers. We're going to do our exam. Our, our studies are going to include a sed rate, c reactive protein, and uh, plates. ESR can be lowered by statins and NSAIDs and give you a false negative. The CRP is not usually affected by statins or NSAIDs, and it's a little bit more sensitive. And of course, they can have an elevated platelet count. Now, the initial symptoms in giant cell headache, polymyalgia rheumatic. I always, I always, I like to use the 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 term chair, hair, stare, and fair. Chair, it's hard to get out of a chair for them. Hair, it hurts when they comb their hair. Stare, it's tough for them to walk upstairs. The muscles involved uh, are all being affected, are, are what's used in these uh, in these tasks. And I also say fair because we thought this was predominantly a Caucasian disease and didn't happen to people in color. Well, the reality is that information comes from a population study uh, many years ago out of Olmstead County, Minnesota, where there were very few people of color. When the same type of study is done in Baltimore, Maryland, it's about 50-50 Caucasian people of color. Fever. Visual symptoms without vision loss, transient ischemic attack or transient diplopia, which may not happen in the office when you see the patient. Weakness, malaise, fatigue. You now, what do all these things have in common? You know, they have normal exam. You know, the exam can be normal, but they can have these gangbuster symptoms. And vision loss, ischemic neuropathy, central artery occlusion, posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, uh, transient ischemic attack, we have to worry about stroke. We also have to worry about giant cell arteritis and a transient diplopia. Now, if you look at the vascular distribution, you know, we got the facial artery, we got the abdominal artery, we got the temporal artery, occipital artery, which should tell you the head pain can be anywhere. I mean, temporal, occipital, neck, ear, jaw, scalp. So pain is pain. You know, when when they when they have any 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 pain at all, could be occipital. I'm I'm fine with that. Temporal artery is only the most surgically accessible and expendable vessel. And to be honest with you, 
we're getting away from temporal artery biopsies. We're doing temporal artery ultrasounds. In fact, in Europe, they don't do biopsies any longer. They do ultrasounds. And we have a great vascular surgeon in Sarasota that does them for us. Now, I think the most important thing here is, you know, if a temporal artery biopsy is done, it's very important to, to, to look at the report because all pathologists are not created equal. And they say there's a negative biopsy, no giant cells, no active arteritis. You think we're good. Well, if they see the term focal interruption of the internal elastic lamina, it means they have a healed arteritis. It is, they have the disease. It's just that the biopsy is not telling you exactly that it's active at this moment. And here's what we need to do. We need IV steroids when the, when the vision is involved. 250 milligrams QID every six hours for three days, followed by orals. And I will tell you, the ER physician at hospitals want to run this by you. They need this information. Otherwise, they have, got, they have to Google it. So non-arterinic ischemic neuropathy is diagnosed in the negative. You can only say it's non arteritic if you prove it isn't arteric. And that's why we should always get the tests. <laughs> and I always remember the E's in GCA. They're elderly. The ESR is elevated. They only see the big E on the eye chart, and it is an E emergency. Hey, Joe, 66. before you move on, move on yeah. to your 66 year old, what mm -hmm. is the specific description of pain that should alarm us or clue us that it is most likely? being an aneurysm. We're going back, I think, to the aneurysm question. Going back to aneurysm, pain is pain. You can't qualify the pain. It is not a boring, debilitating, thunderclap type of pain. Give an example, Temple University football player who had uh, aneurysm with a little bit of headache, little old lady, third nerve palsy, worst headache of her life, diabetes. It's only helpful if it's not there. And most of these people who have ischemic vascular third nerve palsies will talk about a retroorbital pain, which is very troubling to them. So it's only health like you can't qualify it. Now, this is a 66 year old female, new sudden onset vision loss, 2400 due to a long standing macular scar. That hasn't changed, but she noticed there's been a change in her visual field for one day, and she has a new onset inferior arcuoscotoma. She has disc edema, mild pallor, no hemorrhages, no TL injectasia. The other eye has a very small crowded disc at risk, less than a 0.2 CD ratio. She's got mild headache relieved by over-the-counter analgesics. She mentions a little bit of malaise and loss of appetite. She's lost about seven pounds over four weeks. Uh, no jaw claudication, no temporal head pain. And, and this is not a woman who looks in distress. She's your typical uh, Sarasota suburbanite. She's there in her tennis outfit. You know, she, she feels a little bit off uh, physically. And you know, what do you do? Well, you got that disc at risk. She doesn't really have a gangbuster history. You're never really sure. Well, you are sure. Her SED rate was 96. And she was admitted to the hospital and she was put on IV steroids. Fortunately, the infarct was in her bad seeing eye, and she uh, she maintained vision in her good eye. Any acute vision loss in the elderly is GCA until proven otherwise. The five there are five things you have to think about sudden vision loss in the elderly. Number one is giant cell arteritis. Number two through five is giant cell arteritis. So what are you we're saying? Getting, we're getting a nice comment about the elderly being fifty and old, older. So hey, it's, it, it, it's not my opinion. It's just it's just <laughs> what's written written in the literature. Hey, Greg, for you and I, well, it's 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 on it's on our menu too. <laughs> you don't say the patient has blurred vision to the ER doc. You say this elderly patient has sudden lost vision of one eye will go blind totally from giant cell arthritis if they aren't treated with steroids immediately. And they'll listen. Thanks. Now, this is nightmare or nonsense. 78-year-old white male undergoes premium cataract surgery, ends up 2025, right eye, left eye. Sorry about that. I got to proof this. And J1, J2, both eyes. Develops intermittent horizontal double vision at distance. 
It's worse when he's driving at night and watching baseball and basketball on his TV. He is exophoric at near. He's ESO at distance. It's relatively common in right and left gaze. So premium cataract surgery, he's got, he paid $10,000 for his IOLs. He's got 20-25 vision, good reading, but he's now got horizontal double vision. And it's troubling when he's driving at night and watching TV. Greg, it brings me polling question number eight. What do you think? Is this a nightmare or is it nonsense? It's a nightmare because he's got myasthenia gravis. It's a nightmare because pre-IOL patients are always nightmares. It's nonsense because he's got a decompensating phoria. Or I think he's got something else. And here we go, Josie. This is uh, a, a region that doesn't feel that uh, even 70 is, is elderly because we have a comment that, if come into the, that came into the uh, chat room and it says, I've sent two, capital letters, two, stressing two patients with GCA symptoms to the ER. And both times I was told that the mid 70s is too young for GCA by neurology. Thoughts? Absolutely Sounds incorrect. like a teaching experience to me, but, uh, yeah. but your Joe, it's, it's, your thoughts. It's incorrect. <laughs> I mean, the, I the, the last of I've seen have been, have been in their 60s. The, the average age is 72. Okay? That's average. Half are going to be more, half are going to be less. If you, if, if you have to Google something at, uh, or, or do a, a PubMed search and, and send it to them, God bless. That's what you need. All right. So this is a tough one. I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Nightmare because they have myasthenia. Nightmare because IOL, premium IOL patients are always nightmares by nature. I have to agree with that. It's a decompensating for it, or I think the patient has something else. All right, now here's some for some really good neuro op nonsense that's actually very helpful. The sagging eye syndrome. Sometimes we say sagging eye, and sometimes we say saggy eye. When I when I have to tell patients this diagnosis, I preface it by saying, "Look, the name is not nice. I'm sorry, but it just isn't a nice name." Now we have all learned that double vision can be due to nerve, muscle or neuromuscular junction, muscle being thyroid, neuromuscular junction uh, being myasthenia or nerve. We also have to think about tendon. Sagging eye syndrome is a connective tissue degeneration. They have baggy eyelids, a superior, very deep sub superior sulcus deformity, maybe an aponeurotic blepharitosis, maybe they've had a blepharoplasty or, or, or other cosmetic surgery. But we have this lateral rectus, superior rectus band here. And this is connective tissue that connects the superior rectus and the lateral rectus to keep the eye in a good position. Now, this is a manifestation of a decompensating orbital connective tissue dis, you know, degeneration. There's a downward displacement or sag of this pulley, which may be be symptomatically manifesting as a divergence uh, paralysis. They are often ESO at distance and EXO at near. And it can it's often horizontal, but it can be vertical as well. And this is the lateral rectus superior rectus band. It can become saggy, you know, like Keith Richards, and it sags up, and the eye can actually take on this uh, either... Uh, ESO posture or hypo posture and it, that ruptures, they can be even more uncomfortable uh, with this. So this is an acquired vertical and horizontal uh, double vision for these patients. Use a small angle ESO and it, it is usually pretty well, uh, pretty symmetrical, pretty well accommodant. And these are involutional changes in the connective tissue. Most common horizontal double vision, usually worse when they're tired, but then again, everything is worse when you're tired. Mostly they notice when they're driving at night and they have to turn their head to look at the, the side view mirrors. If they're watching TV at distance and something is going across the, uh, the screen very quickly, like baseball or basketball, and they're tired. So it's mostly ESO at distance, exo or ortho at near, could be vertical. 
MRI is confirmatory. It is not really diagnostic. I don't, I don't image these patients. They respond very well to PRISM. Uh, he responded to PRISM diopter base out in driving glasses. I tried with Fresnel first. He liked it. <clears throat> then I made it permanent, but he is still peeved that he has to wear glasses after spending $10,000 for his IOLs. So I'm trying to say, look, it's not my fault. Sure, there was a question that yeah. came in of regarding, you know, for that patient. Do you think that vision therapy would help? No, I do not. I don't think a nip tuck will help either. Fifth, I mean, right. just nightmare and nonsense. Fifty-two hold on, year old. Hold on, male. another one just before you get too far. Mm -hmm. Would would sudden onset of horizontal diplopia vision be a reason of concern uh, than a vertical a double vision? So is, is vertical versus horizontal more concerning to you? No, not really. It's more double common. Vision, it's double vision? Yeah, it's more common horizontal for this. It is relatively not, it's, it, it, it's pretty well competent. No, so I think I'm they're not, asking, not, I think they're asking is in when you have horizontal versus vertical is one more mm -hmm. concerning than the other, not taking your sagging, take saggy out just in general. Uh, ho ho horizontal more than vertical because most vertic vertical are fourth nerve palsies and those are rarely caused to, to be concerned. 52 year old male states his last eye exam was about two years ago with dilation. He noticed he had some peripheral blind spots, left eye more so right, mostly when driving. No overall change in acuity with, other than driving. Glasses don't seem to help his blind spot. He's 20-20 in each eye. No afferent defect. The examination normal, two by two, pink and distinct, all good. And a colleague in my practice ran this visual field. And this is a full field, 120-point screening. And after that, you know, she didn't feel very comfortable. And if you notice, most of the loss is nasal. And the reason most of the loss is nasal is because most of the tested points are nasal. So it doesn't seem to match his complaint about driving. So that brings me to polling question number nine. Is this a nightmare or nonsense? It's nightmare because he's nearly blind or it's nonsense because he's likely malingering? You're caught up on questions. Good. The handout was placed at 8.32 in the chat box and a lot earlier in the presentation. I see it right here at 7.46. So, Greg, I think we're going to have to come back for Nightmares and Nonsense Part 2. I'm not going to finish, finish it, but I do want to finish this little topic here. Yeah, so. It's nightmare because he's nearly blind, or it's nonsense because he's likely malingering. We got a pretty, pretty good, uh, good sense there. And here's his twenty-four dash two. And I want to don't look down here at the total deviation because it's not going to help you. Look at the grayscale. What do you see here? All right, we got that density here. He has got a right a homonymous hemianopic defect. And that's why I don't advocate using the what the one twenty point screenings. They don't help. Thirty dash two, not necessary. See the standard, not necessary. Neuro op is not subtle. A twenty four dash two, see the faster faster is adequate for neurological conditions. Brain with an without contrast. He has got a lobulated supracellular mass, compression of the chiasm, posterior displacement of the midbrain, mild, mild hydrocephalus. He ultimately was referred to a neurosurgeon. He underwent a craniotomy, a near complete removal of the tumor. They didn't get quite all of it. He has been lost to follow, but his wife has called me twice or left a message twice uh, thanking me for finding his brain tumor. Now, is this a nightmare or nonsense? 68 year old male cataract surgery in March of this year. He had some capsular haze, underwent a YAG, didn't really get much better. He is 20 25 in the right eye and the left eye. His referring optometrist in the practice was kind of getting a little frustrated. He, and the patient said, My vision is worse now than before surgery. Bright lights bother me. I'm missing letters when I read. He feels the surgery was botched. His exam was normal, so he was referred to a retinal specialist who found a few drusens, some mild RPE changes, mild VMT, 
that there may have been an old non arrhythmic anterior ischemic neuropathy, and he did a neuro referral, which is to me. Uh, I do the neuro in the practice. So the, our retinal specialist sent the patient to me to take a look, and he looks like this. And we have right-sided visual field loss. Don't look so much down here. Look up here. MRI with and without contrast, a supercell lobulated cystic lesion. It is three, it is, it is exerting mass effect on left optic pathway. It is leading to a midline shift, which is potentially fatal. Uh, it's probably a supercellar arachnoid cyst. And yes, this is a nightmare. I am having a very difficult time right now. I just spoke to him uh, uh, last week, I think on Friday trying to get him into a neurosurgeon. I finally got him into a neurosurgeon. Neurosurgeon, according to the patient, threw up his hand and said, I've never seen this before. You need to go to the University of Florida and get out of here. Nightmare nonsense, 33-year-old male, occipital headache for four months. It worse when he gets, when he stands up after sitting for a period of time. He was actually a dental student. Uh, he has some visual or with headache, relieved by sleep, Denies vision loss, nausea, double vision, pain in eye movement, behavioral changes. Uh, he is referred by his primary care physician, and he looks like this. And what we see is he's got normal visual function, slightly myopic. Uh, his exam is pretty well normal, biomicroscopy normal. He's got nasally inserted uh, optic nerves with a little bit of a juxtapapillary hemorrhage right there. He's got normal acuity. We run a visual field, and his visual field comes out perfectly normal. And I'm going I'm to skip the polling question on this one. Uh, I actually I worked with his internist on this one. We ordered some serology as well as orbiting, uh, imaging of the brain in orbits. And he had a very, very large mass lesion. You can see it's causing a midline shift. This is actually another patient. This is not his uh, image, but this is representative. And he underwent a craniotomy and uh, he uh, had the tumor removed. He went through two rounds of chemotherapy. He ended up uh, graduating dental school. He opened up a practice in the Tampa area. But unfortunately, uh, within five years, he passed away from brain cancer. A normal visual field does not mean there isn't anything. So don't think that if the image, if the uh, field is clear, that the patient is actually clear. Now, I'm going to go through this one fairly quickly because I had a couple uh, I want to talk about. This situation, 39-year-old male, he's a migrant. He developed a new and worsening headache. He goes to the emergency room. He was actually uh, admitted for three days. He got a contrast enhanced CT and an MRI, all subsequently interpreted as normal. His headache was attributed to a migraine, but he and he was medicated as such and, and discharged. Now here's a migrainer who's got a new and worsening headache who subsequently is diagnosed with migraine and given another migraine medicine. But yeah, now his imaging was normal. He had been evaluated for three days and he was admitted. Now, three days after he was, he was released, he developed horizontal and vertical diplopia. Now, this was actually during COVID lockdown. And this was actually a former resident of mine reached out because uh, he got into the weeds on this one. We can see He's got a partial ptosis here. On left gaze, he cannot AD duct. And on right gaze, he cannot AB duct. So he's got a partial third nerve palsy uh, with pupil sparing and a sixth nerve palsy. And this is my resin. I said, look, go, fil go film, put, put it on your iPhone and send it to me. So he's got an abduction deficit here. His eye doesn't turn out. Doesn't look up very well. Doesn't look down very well. Doesn't look up. Doesn't look down. Again, this is not, uh, it's not me doing it. It's my former resident doing it. He could not AD duck. So he has, we, we can see can't look up. 
So visual acuity, visual fields were normal, a right pupil sparing external partial third nerve palsy, concurrent right sixth nerve palsy, worsening headache, and lethargy. Now, where is the lesion? I think if we start looking at uh, where the three and six come together, there are two places. One place is the cavernous sinus. The other place is the posterior orbit. Posterior orbit also has cranial nerve two. His visual acuity is good, so it's not posterior orbit. It is most likely ca cavernous sinus. So let's reach out to the radiologist for a second reading, telling the radiologist, look specifically in the cavernous sinus. Looks at the imaging, says the cavernous sinus is pristine and perfect. But however, the, the pituitary gland looks a little bit chubby. Uh, at which, you know, that's when it became an emergency, explained, my right, patient has to go back to the emergency room, he needs to be evaluated, he has got a pituitary apoplexy. And that's exactly what it was. He had a pituitary apoplexy, a sudden hemorrhagic expansion to a previously unknown pituitary adenoma. It had spread into the right cavernous sinus, is beginning to spread into the left cavernous sinus. Uh, very surprisingly, it was actually not compressing the chiasm, hence his vision was normal and his fields were normal. So he got immediate, admitted immediately for endocrinological and neurosurgical evaluation. Pituitary apoplexy is a potentially fatal disorder. You know, they, they become panhypopituitaristic and they can die from this. So you, you have a hemodynamic instability from adrenal corticotrophic hormone deficiency. It can be fatal. It's due to a rapid expansion, mainly caused by a hemorrhage or infarction of a pre-existing or a non-pre-existing, unknown, a known or ad unknown adenoma. So when people have a sudden onset of headache, ophthalmoparesis, in most cases, a temporal, bitemporal defect, a lethargy. These are people who need to be evaluated urgently for pituitary tumor and pituitary apoplexy. Most common symptom, sudden severe headache and is often overlooked. These are the thunderclap headaches. Now, he didn't have a thunderclap headache. But usually in the ER, they start thinking subarachnoid hemorrhage, venous sinus thrombosis, cervical artery dissection. They don't think pituitary adenoma. This patient was evaluated for three days with imaging, which didn't pick it up. It wasn't until we told them exactly what to look for that they're able to find it. So ultimately, because of COVID, they didn't want to do surgery. He was actually medically stabilized. They, re they replaced his hormones. Uh, and they delayed his surgery during the lockdown. Ultimately, he underwent a transfenoidal removal of the uh, of the tumor, and uh, he actually did very well. Now, I'm going to end right here because we're, we're out of time. We'll come back and do more cases later, uh, Greg. But here's a summary of four mass lesions I just talked about. The vision was normal in each case. Two cases had vertical field loss. Two cases had normal fields. Headache was present in two cases, none in two cases. The pulp and ophthalmoparesis in one case, none in three cases. There's no disc pallor in any case, and there's no disc edema or papilledema in any case. What I'm trying to tell you here is mass lesions don't always follow any expected rules. So with that, Greg, I think we're, we're really... We, we should land this plane. I want to be respectful of everybody, everybody's time. Is there anything else? The questions were excellent. The questions were outstanding. Well, you got two Are more. They, it, okay. You have two more. Um, one, if you can go back to about uh, five minutes ago, and it said, what triggered you to order imaging in that case? What was your clue? Which I'm not sure which case it was. Oh, yeah, so, I, I think I think I know what that was. It would have been this one. And Tim, if, was, Timothy, if this is correct, just let us know. So. It, 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 it was the posturally changing headache. Headaches with 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 emesis, headaches with that change on posture, it gets worse, uh, wakes them from their sleep. Uh, if there is, if there is uh 
headache with orgasm. These are all bad type of headaches. And it's not just migraines that cause auras. Pituitary lobe lesions can also cause auras as well. So I think this is the case. What, what, what prompted us to order was the changing headache. And Tim confirmed that that's the case. And then mm -hmm. the last question is, I think this is a hypothetical coming in. It says, 78-year-old patient who presents with a sudden onset of double vision on horizontal gaze, would they need imaging? A 78, and unfortunately, we're not going to get to the case that talks about this. If we're doing a presumptive third, uh, presumptive sixth nerve policy, and it is isolated, and they're of that age, the answer is I generally say no, but I do offer it to patients. I think we'll just have to come back and finish this, uh, finish this talk later. I got a little too ambitious. Uh, comment hey. rolling in. I had a patient tell me that she was told headache and orgasm was normal. <laughs> now that I mean that is I'm not gonna say it is it is always abnormal, but it is concerning. And a a a headache with or with orgasm that happens once or rarely is less concerning but if it is happening frequently that is more concerning i think that's it greg so you know we had a, lot, a few more good interesting cases but i got too ambitious the questions were great they enjoyed that let's just uh let's just call it and we'll come back and finish them uh, in the new year sounds good uh, you're getting your virtual round of applause uh Thanks for the excellent play presentation, guys. Thank you. Good job, Joe. So you can go ahead and look, open up the chat, get your virtual round of applause there. I think we've completed all the questions. Thanks, everyone, for attending. That was Nightmares and Nonsense Navigating Neuro Op. This is an interactive distance learning course. It is also known as synchronous virtual. Joe, thank you for uh, navigating us through those cases.